Okay, we're rolling. This is an interview at the Four Points, Sheridan, Manhattan, New York City. Uh, it is the 11th of January, 2005, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay, my name is Norman Handelman. Uh, I was born seven, July 14, 1923, in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? Uh, I was in college at the time of the war, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, the, co the co college was very affected by the war, of course. A lot of people were being drafted mm -hmm. in classes, and they started making edicts of all sorts that it, uh, if, you, uh, if you took enough courses of your, of your major, then you could be forgiven your, uh, the courses that were not major courses like art and music and, mm -hmm. and philosophy, mm -hmm. things like that. And then, as it came to 1943, when I was drafted, uh, it came down that if you passed the midterm, you got credit for the term. Mm -hmm. So I passed, I was drafted shortly after the midterm, which meant I got credit for the term, which meant I also got credit for the courses that I was, was uh, you know, forgiven. So I had an abbreviated college uh, degree. I got a degree in college. Mm -hmm. But it was like a two and a half year college. I missed a lot of courses that a lot of mm -hmm. people take. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that was, and, and so I went into service right from there. Okay. Do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, yeah, I remember. There's some, I was in my house, I was in my apartment, and I was listening to a football game. Giants. Giants, what's it? Yeah, okay. Everybody. <laughs> that, thank you, because I, I thought it was bad, the Chicago, Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's what. <laughs> yeah, I was, that's where it was. And all of a sudden, there's a break-in, an announcement of some sort, something about uh, somebody has announced that Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, I had no idea what yeah, Pearl was, Harbor was. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, then you know, slowly the news started trickling mm -hmm. out. But I think the game went on to the finish because mm -hmm. nobody knew what the, the enormity of it. Right. Okay. So you were you were drafted. Yeah. No, you ended up in the Air Corps, or did you...? Yeah, I, I ended up in the Air Corps. When I was drafted, you went before the... Uh, when I passed all my physical and mm -hmm. stuff like that, I went down to Lexington Avenue, Grand Central Station, basically, post office. And there were several interview, several people there, representative of the Marines, the Navy, the, the Army, and the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. So they all looked you over, looked your records over, and I was selected for the Air Force, the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Okay, where did you go for your basic training? <clears throat> Miami, Florida. We would, we were dressed. It was winter time. Oh, well, it was it's late spring. We were given the winter clothing, and we put on a train, a coal burning train. I remember that a lot of soot and all that. And I don't remember how long it took us to get down to Florida, but we got down to Florida, and we were told we, nobody was going to tell us where we were going top secret and all that. Mm -hmm. So there we were in winter clothing, <laughs> getting down to Miami Beach, and we got out. And of course we changed, but mm -hmm. so Miami Beach was where, uh, where I was trained. Now did you stay in a hotel? Yeah, what? yeah. Okay. It was a small hotel up the beach. I have visited a couple of times just for reminiscence sake. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have some pictures. I didn't bring it with me, but I have some pictures of the hotel and doing laundry on the, on the top, on the roof. Uh -huh. and Must have been pretty nice back then. It was. Oh, it's a beautiful beach. Uh -huh. Beautiful beach. Yeah. How was your training there? Uh, well, it was not hard. Uh -huh. It was not um, I don't remember anything. My image of what infantry training was like was very arduous and exposure to all kinds of things. But down there, I just remember marching and uh, learning, you know, right face, left face, about face, mm -hmm. pre present arms. I don't know if we had arms, but something like that. Uh -huh. And so how you, the, the right way to salute, you know, there's, not, there's a right way to salute. Right. You don't salute like this, you salute like that, mm -hmm. etc. How much time did you spend down there? I think it was six weeks. It was okay. April. Probably six weeks to eight weeks. Okay. And where'd you go from there? From there, on a train again, out to St. Louis, mm -hmm. where I went to, I was, at that point, they had done all kinds of orientation tests and the like, and uh, 
<clears throat> I wound up uh, in radio school, uh, where I, we learned uh, Morse code, basically. And we learned also how the uh, um, Air Corps radio system worked. Uh, yet the planes were equipped with long antennas, and there were what they called co command units, I think. You could you'd change them to change the frequency in a big, bulky tube kind of arrangements. So we, learn, so we learned Morse code in varying steps. And they gave us some kind of mock-ups occasionally. We wound up in a little com compartment by ourselves. And uh, <clears throat> we were fed uh, Morse code at varying speeds. And I did well. I did well enough to get some kind of special days off where my parents came out to visit. And, Visited, so that's and from there. I don't. Know, I guess the next question would be what uh -huh. happened then. Went down to gunnery school in uh, Harlingen, Texas, and I must say, for for a sheltered boy living and not knowing anything but Brooklyn, uh, it was a treat for me. I mean, St. Louis was a treat because of all the greenery. I, you know, I lived in Brooklyn, where even though I was on a Parkway. Everything was gray and concrete, that uh -huh. sort of thing. There I was in St. Louis, beautiful parks, beautiful white, white streets. And in Harlingen, uh, it was also lovely, very wide, you know, very big skies, palm trees, uh, and a lot of exciting things to do. They gave us all kinds of, they took, we were taught in the, air, in the air, air, air Force, taught to lead enemy planes. In other words, planes coming in, you don't fire at him up there. You know he's coming in, mm -hmm. so you, you lead him. Depending on how far he went, that you lead him by what they call RADs, the, the circular vision of the um, whatever the aiming thing is. Mm -hmm. So you, we were learning to lead. That so we wound up uh, with shotguns. We wound up you know, you know clay pigeons. We wound up uh, uh, riding on trucks on open trucks. Uh, on a course where, where suddenly a clay pigeon would come out and you were supposed to get, get at him and you know by leading him and we also did a lot of BB shooting uh, uh, no no not BBs what were you called the tiny bullets uh, 22 yeah 22 is right a lot of that and I had a great time it was like target practice for me there was no real major uh, I don't remember any major problem maybe KP once in a while but that's all mm -hmm. But other than that, it was for me, as I said, you know, it, it was kind of like an unreal experience. You know, there, first of all, the Air, the Air Force is kind of sheltered. <clears throat> now, the infantry, you know, once basic training, and you, I, I imagine, basic training, you're really in, in the mud all mm -hmm. the time, basically. Mm -hmm. In the airport, we weren't. We were not quite coddled, but it was, it was nice. Mm -hmm. And so... We we enjoyed ourselves. We were young kids playing, playing at shooting and all those things. And as I said, for me, a sheltered boy from Brooklyn, the idea of shooting bullets and shooting. Uh, and you probably never handled the gun. Never, prior to never, no, no, not at all. When did you first uh, start receiving training on an airplane? I didn't receive training in an airplane. Well, we did a little bit of, how shall we say? Exposure to airplane. Mm -hmm. There were in at gunnery school. There were um, we would go up in a. I think they called them AT sixes at the time. They were mm -hmm. two seaters. Right. The pilot would take us up, uh, and there'd be some. Turns out later I found out that women Air Corps the wax would fly target planes, fly planes pulling long you know long distance away some targets you were supposed to shoot at with this machine gun that you were given. I did poorly, but uh, so did most of us. <clears throat> and so that was, the, that was the only exposure I had, the only experience I had in firing a machine gun. I think I had, in gunnery school, I had learned a Tommy gun, but not a standing machine gun. Mm -hmm. So that, that was it, just no real training. By that time, the war was, we didn't know it, of course, because as far as we were concerned, the war was never going to end. You know, that was... Mm -hmm. It was something that just didn't seem like it was ever. You lived, you lived, you lived in a wartime, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And for all you know, you'd be an old man discharged from service. The war would be continuing. So, got uh, got it. Then 
<coughs> got orders to ship out, so we went down to a collection point in Newport News where uh, uh, we, I went with a bunch of my friends from gunnery school, from gunnery school, also others I had met in this collection point, one of whom became a real good buddy of mine. Uh, and we collected, it was a Newport News, someplace like that, and we were going to go to, we didn't know where, of course, top secret, mm -hmm. on a boat, on a ship. So we had this big ship, the USS Randall, I remember that. It was, it was its amazing voyage, and it was a troop ship. It carried thousands of troops. It was fast, and it needed no escort, so we traveled alone. <laughs> we left Newport News, went around um, <coughs> based to the Panama Canal, through the Panama Canal, I remember you know, watching us go through the mm -hmm. canal, to the Panama Canal, down South Pacific, all the way up through the, through the New Zealand Islands, and around to the west coast of Australia, and where we docked in Perth 30 days later. So 30 days aboard ship. And then we stayed overnight, we stayed two nights in Perth, and some friends and I took uh, suburban trains into Fremantle, things like that. And then we got on sh board ship again, and for 15 more days, again, we were told we didn't know where we were going. Of course, when you're going down, you're not going to Europe, mm -hmm. and you're going someplace south, where could you go? By that time, they, who, who ever knew of a war going on in CBI? Mm -hmm. So we wound up, it wasn't like till a couple of days out of Bombay, because we went all the way around Africa to Madagascar to avoid submarines. And we wound up in Bombay, and of course at that point we, we were told we, we could let our people know. What could we let them know? We, no, we couldn't do anything really. Somewhere, wherever. And from there, again, waiting to find out what we were going to do, because we were replacements. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> got on board a train again, uh, went across India by Indian third class trains with sleep on slatted benches and you see exotic scenery, I mean stuff like, you know, stuff that was newsreels were made of and wound up in Calcutta and there we waited, it was monsoon season at that point, so we waited, I remember waiting with my group, waiting in the outside, beautiful blue sky, nice Nice, but all of a sudden, it, it just seemed like that. Just all of a sudden, it poured. The beautiful blue sky it just turned black in no time. Poured and then stopped. And the sun came out, and we were soaked, and we were dry. That was it. So we stayed in tents for a few nights, and then we were transported up uh, somewhere north of uh, Calcutta. I've been trying to look. I've been trying to locate it on the maps. I don't see the names. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Madagascar, it's Tezgan, Kermatola, stuff like that. But they're not on the maps. And then, this being the monsoon season, we hung around for a couple of weeks, kind of getting used to what was going on. You know, I, I remember I said how it was like a game and all that. Mm -hmm. I remember coming back when we got there. <clears throat> the bombing mission time was ending because you don't bomb during the monsoon season. You can't see your target. Mm -hmm. So, remember, remember a mission? We were in the orderly room or something like that where guys coming back from a mission came in and one guy was crying and furious with the operations officer. A big, big strapping Swedish guy crying and furious at the fact that his buddy had been shot down. And I still remember, you know, it registered with me, but nowhere did I feel like, oh my God, this is terrible. I could die, it could happen to me. It just didn't register. Uh, I don't think for any of us it really registered. It was like, it's your job. You're here, you know, something could happen on your way down here from Albany if that's where you come from. So you just do your job. So, so after a few weeks, we were assigned different, uh, different planes 
because we were replacement radio operators. Right. And, you know, there was attrition of some sort. Sometimes people got sick or they got wounded or they died or opted out or whatever. So we were assigned. And then we went on um, gas hauling missions. We flew the hump. We took gas and... Uh, now you were assigned to a B-24. I, I was... No, was I wasn't assigned. Oh, I was okay. assigned every every time I flew. It was a different B-24. Okay. I didn't get any final. So you had no, no group stable cohesion. crew. Then. No, no. Oh, okay. Did you have a decorated uh, flight jacket or anything like that? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I got a, I got a picture of me. I'll show it later, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I have a picture of that too. Some pictures of it. Um, yeah, so we went, we flew on a lot of these hauling missions, which were themselves, you know, again, they were dangerous, but being a kid and being a job, it didn't feel dangerous. How did you carry fuel in a, a B-24? Well, you know, I'm not really clear on that, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we had bomb bay tanks. Right. That was one place. You, instead of having bombs, you'd have mm -hmm. tanks put in there. Uh, I guess that must have been it, mm -hmm. because I can't think of any place. Were they like 55-gallon drums or something like that? They were big. They were big. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know what 55-gallon drums were this big, I guess. Yeah. It may have been bigger, or it may have been many of them. Mm -hmm. Probably many of them. Okay. Uh, and sometimes we ferried soldiers across. Were you ever under attack by the Japanese? No, no, never on the, these missions. Okay. By the time we were there, the Japanese had finally been stopped. Uh, they, they, you know, they had they had encroached on into Burma. They were pretty close to the border of India, mm -hmm. and at the time there were some Indian um, groups that really didn't like the British at all, so were quite willing to throw in their hands with the uh, Japanese. So the Japanese were really pretty close to getting into India, but they were stopped by various, uh, there was whole, whole kinds of reasons for them to stop. Supply lines got short, uh, the, weather, the jungles were terrible, mm -hmm. etc. But they got stopped. And so by that time, they were starting to retreat a little bit. So, so anyhow, when we flew, I remember flying the hump, the, the, the mountains would be, you know, it's very sizable. I don't know how high, 15,000 feet, something like that. And when you get over them, there'd be a sudden down drop, because I was so space, air, I guess. And I remember, I was never scared. I keep on saying that. I wasn't scared until, and it, as a radio operator, I sat on my parachute. It was in the seat mm -hmm. under me. Uh, I don't know exactly where I would have jumped out from, but had I had to, I would, would have. And I sat on the, the, uh, the chute. Until he, one day over this hump, this my, the engineer, my friend, or a friend, suddenly started putting his parachute on. I had never seen this before. I said, what's wrong? He said, nothing. I thought, he put, he, put, he put his chute on. I figured if he's putting the chute on, and he's the engineer, he must know something. So from then on, I, I had my chute immediately available. But, Did you but, ever wear flak jackets? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, and because later on we went on bombing missions mm -hmm. when the monsoon season ended. Then we came back, and yes, then we wore flak jackets, and sometimes flying high we we wore uh, heated suits. Mm -hmm. I'm to, I don't remember if we wore flak helmets. I guess we must have. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, one of the things we had to learn at gunnery school. Again, this was, I, I, told me I was a sheltered boy, as I've said, and I had never really done anything with my hands. I had been studying all the time, mm -hmm. basically. I learned, as everybody else did, to take a, a 50 caliber machine gun apart and put it together again, blindfolded. And you got to name, know the names of every last piece. And I remember you got down to the smallest piece that had the longest name. So I, I couldn't do it again, of course. but. I remember that. So, what else? Did you have any problems with any kind of tropical diseases over there? I didn't. I don't know. We had we, we took Adabrin, I believe, which 
or maybe it was a little bit later, uh, Adamant found out it turns you it turns you yellow, mm -hmm. and I started noticing my my eyeballs are looking a little strange. It was the Adamant. Uh, we were told to watch out for the waters. We, took, we were told to watch out basically for sanitation levels were different. Uh, no other diseases that I know of. Uh, I remember, where was it? Some place early in India, we were told not to, to watch out for, for out the Indian alcohol, the liquor. Uh -huh. I was not a drinker, so it didn't matter to me. But they were told, watch out for it because it can, it can, it can blind you. And I remember seeing a guy coming back, having drunk a lot, and he was blind. It didn't last, uh -huh. but he was blind. And he was terrified, of course. Yeah. Uh, so that's that kind of disease, yeah. Or, or the idea maybe of consorting with prostitutes. Mm -hmm. They were, I don't know if you know in your interview, they were what they called pro kits. Mm -hmm. You know about them, okay. So there were pro kits available at the, at the medical. Why don't you describe them for like someone watching this tape? Okay. Sometime, what, what, what were they? A pro kit was basically it included condom to use uh, and some kind of prophylactic ointment to put inside it, and then something else to use after you finished the intercourse, mm -hmm. something else to use to inject into your penis to protect the penis against any mm -hmm. intrusion of, of germs. Mm -hmm. And that was, and I think, to, and to wash. And some kind, maybe some special soap, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. But that was generally the pro kit. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, was it was a given, I guess it was given to you on your leave. Mm -hmm. so. What was uh, daily life like in, in your camps and so on? Okay, it was not bad. It was not bad. For, for the, Air Corps, the Air Force, the Air Corps, between missions there's nothing to do. You know, there's, you, know, there's, uh, you can go to the, to the, um, what's the room, for, what's the name for the room where you go and you know, relax and the like. We had, we had it easy. I just, I have to stress that I did not have a bad war. Like a day room, I think they called it, where you could go yeah, and relax. Yeah, the day room, right, yeah. right, yeah. Well, you could, I don't remember if there was ping pong there. There might have been. Mm -hmm. It was a relaxation place. Uh, Did you have any USO shows coming? Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. We had some USO shows coming, and uh, I remember one. There was some. We we didn't see any women, except the Indian women, and we saw them at a distance. Uh, we had a USO show. We had several. One of them I remember was like the last new USO show we got, because several of the guys got very disorderly and started uh, making all kinds of obscene remarks about uh, the girl, about the girls, and what he wanted to do with them, that sort of thing. And the orders came down from the big wigs. That's it. No more. Can't trust you guys. So, what else? Yeah, I can't think of any tropical diseases to mention. Yeah. I think I, I, I have this friend, as I said, whom I see every couple of years or so. Mm -hmm. We're still we're surviving nicely. He was my buddy in in uh, the war, and uh, uh, in the Indian India war. And I know. I mean, I have pictures showing me with a forty-five automatic in holster around my mm -hmm. shoulder. I showed up. I don't think we, we carried them around. <clears throat> but there was a place for two, for two automatic clips. So I know, I know we had them. Maybe we were given the clips when we left. But you go on, when you go on a mission, even on a flight to haul gas, because there was always the danger of something happening to the plane. Mm -hmm. And the jungles down below us were, were infested with Japanese. So... Uh, we were we were given kits to carry with us. We have one of the things we had. I I regret not having taken it with me when the war when I came home. 
that we were given two small buttons. We had a flight suit which had buttons on it, mm -hmm. like metal copper buttons or something. Mm -hmm. We were given two of them to replace two of the buttons on the suit. And when you did that, they were indistinguishable from the other buttons. One of them had a, a little, a little uh, bump on it. The other had two bumps. And if you need it, you put them together, they were a compass. They, you put them down, they were magnetized, and they pointed north. So that was one of the escape things we were given. Also, we were get, I don't remember where the carbines were. We had carbines, these small 30 millimeter mm -hmm. uh, rifles. I don't remember where they were. They may have been in the planes. But the planes themselves, we, when, we, when we flew on bombing missions, well, we were also ready. We might have had some fighters had we flown, had we, you know, into, into the, the hump. So <clears throat> we, we had these 50 caliber machine guns with belts and all. And by and large, until we, until we flew the hump, we flew at relatively low altitude. We were, um, we, we, it was, and it was warm there, so didn't have to wear too much. And we could fly with an open waist window. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around. That's okay. Yeah. I was just remembering something. Uh, my, my, my lifetime experience with weightlessness. Uh, I was, I was, hadn't flown for quite for about a month overseas because I was my best buddy from the, all the war to the beginning was shot down. We went on this mission. Um, it was great fun seeing the, you know, watching the bombs drop and all that. He went on a mission a few days later, and, and he didn't come back. And I was, you know, I, I'm a little more upset now thinking of it than I was then. I was upset though because I just, I just felt like I can't fly. I just I can't fly. And I, I knew the policy there was you wouldn't be charged with any kind of major offense. They would just ground you and get another replacement. So I, it took me a long time. I was finally, I was going on a mission. I was, we were awakened about 3.30, 4.30, depending on our, how long the mission was. And we had very long missions from up in India all the way down into Burma. Sometimes we, they would go 12 hours, 14 hours. We bombed uh, the, the bridge over the River Kwai. Mm -hmm. and that's a long distance from India. So that mission would be like 16 hours. So, um, anyhow, so I, I got grounded that month, and finally I decided I can't live this way. I want to fly. I want to fly, and I want to have a better chance of coming home, at least for a leave, a furlough, than if I just stay on the ground, because this war is never going to end. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I volunteered to fly uh, on a training mission. The pilot was being trained for... Uh, for um, night flying, or, or instrument flying. and But the training which involved all kinds of maneuvers and the like, and up and down. Now in the B-24, up, way up front, was the bombardier, and I think the nose gunner too, but I'm not sure about that. He might have, yeah, the bombardier and the nose gunner. He was way up front, downstairs. Then there was the, co the cabin cockpit with a pilot and co-pilot one. Then there was a, a narrow partition, and on the, on the right-hand side it was where the radio operator sat with the radios. And the major job of a radio operator on a flight is to listen to hear if the flight's been canceled or diverted. And it, you, ha you have to know the code or the code name for the day, uh, and then you, of course you could you write. If, it come, if a message comes, you put it down and decode it. Uh, and so we sat at the head, uh, with the headset on, on the right-hand side. The left-hand side was the, um, the engineer. And he had his own desk, as we did. So anyhow, I was sitting... Okay. Also, the plane that we flew in, there are various models. The, uh, the plane we flew in, you, had a, you went up to a little trap door underneath the plane. Mm -hmm. went up the trap door, 
And then your little compartment, there was a, uh, a gallon of uh, fuel for a little engine, the, 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 what we call it the putt-putt engine. That kind of warmed the major engines, got them primed for starting. And you go up, there's one more trap door, you open the trap door, come up, and now you got a floor, and there's where the radio operator sits, where the engineer sits, and the floor, then, then you walk straight through the walk, walkway, the catwalk, through the bombs, there's a narrow catwalk right this wide, and then you come to the waist. Now, in this, in this flight that I'm talking about, Pilot was doing various maneuvers, and at one point, what he was doing apparently was checking out a stall by instrument. So he went up, and then, then stalled, and the B-24 started falling. Now we, I had no, we had no idea what he was doing. He was just being told by the instructor what to do. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I felt like I was being pressed up against the ceiling of this plane, and then I, and I thought, oh, it must be upside down. So I started to try to right myself, and I couldn't do that because then, then I saw, I saw the trap door open, and up comes floating this one gallon can of gasoline. And I figured, no, there's, there's something else. Something's wrong. I didn't know about weightlessness. So that's my experience with weightlessness. Mm -hmm. Guys who were sitting in the waist, and as I said, it was warm there. Had the waist windows open. And they were just hanging around, and what, before they knew it, they were starting to float towards the windows, yeah. and to float out. And they were grabbing things. So, of course, nobody, nobody got hurt. But hmm. so that was that was exciting. So that was my experience with weightlessness. Did you guys carry any kind of uh, well, they called them uh, a blood ship? Yeah, I have one here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now you mentioned in your form that you had some detached service. What was yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, after a few, after a few bombing missions, um, uh, but what would happen is I'll I'll get to that. But mm -hmm. I want to make a story. It's okay. Uh, to go on a mission, you be awakened. You go in. You have a breakfast. You go into the. Uh, room, and you'll be told what the mission of the day is. You've been told, like, like, at one point, you know, watch out, here is a prisoner of war camp, you want to see to it that you don't bomb the prisoner of war camp, but you want to get the railroad uh, uh, station and tracks and service here. So, and then, then we were, we went out and we went into another room where we picked up our parachutes, and uh, we also picked up a belt. Uh, it's like a life preserver belt, uh, which we had on board ship. Only the belt had, I forget what else it had in it, but it had a whole bunch of things to be used in case you're, you're downed, in case you're on the ground. Now we had the bloodshed to help in one way, but the, we also had in this, there was a tin. And there was, the tin had opium in it, it turns out. And there was also American dollar bills, old bills. Mm -hmm. So the old bills were in order that if you if you were down and you gave them to uh, to the people who were helping you, they couldn't be accused by the Japanese of having had these bills recently because mm -hmm. they were so old. And the opium was as a special bribe for people to help us get out. Because we were, they were told, and it was true, they, I have a friend who indeed was, was downed and got, was taken out by the Chinese, and they did indeed help him all the way through. There were quite a few like that. So, oh yeah, detached service. So, let me, let me brag about something else that happened. We were, we were shown the dangers of anoxia in our training. Uh, that we were get taken into a decompression chamber where we were told that you want to you want to wear a mask when you're above 12,000 feet because oxygen deprives your brain of the capacity to work well. 
but it was hard to know, you know, so we're going to show you guys. So every groups of us would be taken into this chamber, and they would slowly lower the, the oxygen content, and they reached like 25,000 feet, or maybe, early, maybe sooner than that. But whatever it was, they showed that early on, 12, 13, 14,000 feet judgment was off. I remember watching one guy, yeah, we are now pretty high, he was asked, write your, write your uh, name, rank, and serial number. Now, my case was Norman S. Handelman, uh, 327, whatever, I forget what it was. Uh, and you just keep on writing it. Just keep on writing it. I remember watching this guy writing, writing, and then his hand started to tremble, and he, he got uncoordinated, and he dropped the pencil, and just stared blankly into space. He was just out. And somebody gave him the pencil back and gave him some oxygen. Well, yeah, we had this oxygen mask on, and they're plugged into the oxygen uh, serving unit. And he was told, because we were all were wearing it by this time, he was told unplug his. Uh, no, un un uh, unplug his, yeah. It was a male-female plug. Unplug it and do this exercise. So he did. And, and then, so as he, was, as he was passing out, he was told, plug your oxygen mask in, plug the mask in, plug the mask in. And his, his hands were only five, he lost it. And he just passed out. So they plugged it back in for him. Oh, they gave, and they gave him the pencil, and he immediately started writing his name, Ryan, as if nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I was going to do an experiment with myself. Uh, I volunteered. What a jerk. I've <laughs> heard of brain damage. <laughs> but I volunteered. And uh, I remember that, you know, they gave me, they told me this thing, unplug it, okay. And I remember, you know, name, rank, and serial number. And I felt, I felt, oh my, I felt so wonderful. My handwriting was, I had never seen my handwriting this good. It felt so good. It was really, and then they gave me this pencil. And that's how it felt to me. And I started writing, and all of a sudden I realized I had passed out because there was a scroll there, but I hadn't known it. I figured, well, this is a routine, this is a rote message, so I'm going to try something else. So I volunteered again. I figured I'll do the Gettysburg Address. So, okay, four score and, and seven years ago, our fathers brought it on this continent, upon this continent, four score, and just got, you know, dedicated to liberty and dedicated to the person, to the liberty, and, you know, started repeating myself, and then it ended. So they gave me the pencil again, and at this point, I didn't know what I was doing. I just stopped. I realized I had passed out. But a routine matter, you'd think you had been doing it all along. So anyhow, about the attached service. <laughs> uh, when you come back from a mission, you'd be given a slug of whiskey, and you'd work your way back to the room where they'd debrief you, you know, tell what you saw, what, what happened, um, how much flak was it, where was it, any fighters, etc. What, what do you think the, the results of the bombing were, and so on. Came back from this mission, and you know, you're kind of tired. You got up early, and it's been tense. Cut back, and I'm starting to relax, and some, somebody comes from the orderly room saying the Major wants to see you. I said, what for? I don't know. So I go into the office, and they say, pack up your clothing, you're going on a secret mission. Secret mission? Well, the hope of everybody, everybody there, was the mission would be go back on a bond-selling tour in the States. <laughs> so, they get that. But all I was told was a secret mission. So, got, on the, got back to the, to, the, to the barracks. And the barracks, by the way, we, as I said, we had it easy. We had uh, bearers. We had men who cleaned the barracks. We slept on charpoys, and when we when we had beds, we slept on charpoys, which were string beds, beds with interwoven uh, sisal, uh, on top of which was were blankets, and four posters so the medics, so the uh, mosquito nets could cover you. But the cleanliness was, it was taken care of. We had somebody we hired, all of us, probably eight to twelve of us in this room, in this barracks, who hired him to. Mm -hmm. So I come back, and everybody else is taking off their clothing. 
here I am packing my bags. Where are you going, Edelman? So I said, I'm going on a secret mission. Figured I, I got something over them. So they, uh, wait, what do you mean secret mission? Well, that's what I've been told. It's a secret mission. What do you think it is? I don't know. Maybe it's a bond selling tour. I don't know. What could it be? So I get on this, so I, I pack up, and the next day, the, get to the, the truck takes me to the airport, to the uh, airstrip, get on the plane, take it. God knows where I'm going. I don't know. Maybe, who knows? Maybe into Delhi. Maybe home. So get in, get on the truck, and about 20 minutes later, get on, and then we get on the plane. 20 minutes later, plane lands. That's a pretty short trip. So I figured that's not that's not home. Well, maybe you're going to change planes there, because I mean, the secret mission for God's sake is only 20 minutes. So we wait, wait for the other plane. A truck comes and takes us to another airstrip, air, air site, where we were then, these, these are a whole bunch of us, a whole, several crews of us, and we were replacements for combat cargo. Well, we did then, and then I became part of combat cargo, on detached service. Mm -hmm. So what we did then, we, we carried all kinds of cargo to the frontline troops in Burma. So, you know, all kinds of all kinds of stuff, canned stuff. And no, we may have carried some ammo. I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. But so that was our detached service. And then I came back, and I had logged many many hours. We went by hours <coughs> in terms of uh, citations and the like. So you didn't go by number of missions, you went by a number of hours. Well, I, we, we, or we, number of flights. Flights, okay. Yeah, but they weren't, they were all varied. I mean, some were mm -hmm. carrying gas across the hump, and mm -hmm. some were bombing in Burma, some were, or in, in Thailand, and some were uh, uh, giving you know, food and ammunition to frontline troops. So I, in total, I had 60 flights that were, you know, we were flying in planes at high oxygen fuel mm -hmm. and carrying dangerous cargo in dangerous areas. So I had 60 flights. And the way it worked there, so I came back and most of my friends had gone home by then because they had served their bombing missions and I was, I had been doing some lesser than bombing missions. Came back, but I was scheduled for uh, return home too. Uh, and at the time, as I said, you got medals based on, based on the number of hours you had put in. So you got an air medal if you put in, I don't know what, 100 hours, say. And you got an air leaf cluster if you put in 200. And you got a distinguished flying cross if you had put in 300, you know, combat hours. And then a third oak leaf cluster for another 100. And another hundred would bring you a ultimate cluster to the DFC. And I had I had just a few hours short of an oak leaf cluster, and I did something that soldiers are told time and time again, don't volunteer for anything. I figured I'd like to get that oak leaf cluster. So I volunteered for a mission, even though I knew I was going home, I was told. Thank God I'm here, so but so I was all set for the mission. It was supposed to be an easy mission. It was supposed to be what they called bakshish, a milk run. And I get, uh, I get awakened. I get to the to the flight line. Our plane is, is scrubbed. Something's malfunctioning. So okay, I'll go. And that's a mission from hell. The guys, some didn't come back. Some came limping back. It was not a good mission because it was Rangoon, where all the Japanese had concentrated their flak and their planes and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I got, I got out of it, but uh, I had volunteered, but foolish thing. Hmm. So that was my detached service. And then, just to add kind of insult to injury, when I came back, I didn't fly back. I came back by boat again. I got on a troop ship in Calcutta, went through the Suez Canal, the Mediterranean, straight to Gibraltar, back to the same place I had embarked from. Yeah, 30 days this time. I put in two and a half months at sea. 
which is more than a lot of Navy guns do. So what, what else? I think that's about Then, of course, you know, I come back. And I was one of the earliest people back. I came back in October of 45 because I had, you got points, you got point, points at the time for overseas time and combat time and medals and all different points. So I came back and uh, I, was a, I was a changed boy by that point. I, I had had experiences that I never had dreamed of having. Uh, and I, you know, for me, um, remember somebody once called it, you had a good war, and I did. I really was, I was fortunate. I, had, I met people there, I, met, I saw things I had never seen, never would see. I like escaped on stay unscathed. I met friends. I said one of whom I still correspond and visit with. So, do you remember uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor or Pearl Harbor, uh, the dropping the atomic bombs? Yeah, I was home. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, I was coming home. I was on board ship when Germany surrendered. Uh -huh. And of course, there was a celebration, but at the same time, the war was still on with the Japanese. And I had been in the Japanese, you know, fighting the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So for, it felt like, well, okay, it's very nice that the war is over, but I thought the, the Germans surrendered. But, you know, we're going back again. Mm -hmm. So you know, that was the prospect, we'd go back. And, uh, and of course, it would be worse because the Japanese would be concentrated. So I was at home on leave. Yeah, I was on leave. And the, the atomic bomb dropped. I was delighted. Oh, so were all my uh -huh. colleagues. Because it, we, that ended the war. Because Do you remember about the death of President Roosevelt? Where you were? That too. We were overseas when that happened. Uh -huh. Yeah. Remember, President Roosevelt died. He did. Oh my God, that's awful. It's terrible. Who's the vice president? Nobody knew who the vice president was. Nobody knew the name Truman. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was that was shocking, of course. What, what's going to happen next? Because mm -hmm. he was really he was the man. Yeah. When where were you discharged? I was discharged in New York City in October, forty-five. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, make use of the GI Bill at all? Oh yeah, oh yeah, very much so. Oh, yeah. I, we, you know, we had the 5220 club. Right, I was just going to ask you about yeah. that. Uh, you know, 52 weeks at $20 mm -hmm. a week unemployment. After a few weeks, I just couldn't just hang around and just collect the money. And I had been trained basically as an accountant. And, but I, I didn't, I knew I didn't want to be an accountant. I, I, I just didn't. There was just, I had had too many opening experiences in life at that point. Accountant is sitting in a, an office with scribbling numbers. Just didn't seem, didn't appeal to me anymore. But I was advised by a cousin, a knowledgeable cousin, that went to a, as a counselor, try it out. So I tried for six months. It was terrible. I just sat and wrote numbers and I hated it, every minute of it. And finally after six months I, I quit. I started looking for what to do, and I went well, looking for schooling. I didn't know what I was going. I thought maybe, maybe journalism, mm -hmm. uh, maybe use my radio skills in an airline pilot plane. But there was nothing there that I knew of. And journalism schools were closed by the time I looked to get in, so I didn't know what to do. Somehow the idea of psychology had. The idea of understanding people had come to my mind by some conversations I had had for lunch during lunches. So I went to uh, I went to visit the, the dean of the psychology department at NYU, and he he was very discouraging. He said, "There's no you can't make a living, you can't make money, whatever." At the time, there really wasn't a way for psychologists to make money, basically. Not for many, anyhow. And just around that time, a lot of veterans were coming home with a lot of mental disturbances. And the Veterans Administration was swamped. They didn't have the facilities or the people to 
to work with him. And the number of psychiatrists was limited. So I don't know how they got the idea, but they, they established some training programs. I think, I think under the National Institutes of Mental Health, but I'm not sure about that, mm -hmm. or the VA. So they had this training programs, which just the time I was looking to get into psychology was there. So I, I took a test, and I evidently you know, passed the test. And I was accepted for a four-year training program in, in clinical psychology. Well, at the same time as going to school, you'd work 20 hours a week. So I had, you know, I had a lot of good training that way. Mm -hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations? I joined AMVETS briefly. I, I just, I didn't like the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I felt it was much too... <sighs> bound with tradition and and it just did not set the right political slant for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and veterans of foreign wars, or Jewish veterans, none of them, again, they all seem like organization type mm -hmm. things. So the AMVETS came around at that point too, and it had a very short life. Mm -hmm. But that, that attracted me. But again, I really wasn't focused on that. I was mm -hmm. focused on getting my life together and becoming something. Now you did say you uh, did keep contacts uh, of people who served with you, especially one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, in my, <clears throat> I met my best buddy who had been with me in radio school and gunnery school was, was shot down in mm -hmm. in uh, in India in Burma. Coming across on the ship, I met another guy. I met other people. I met this other fellow, Bob Locanto, uh, and we became good friends. We had a lot of great conversations and uh, shared a lot. And as a matter of fact, we, we, started, we shared a tent in Israel, in Israel, India, sorry, <laughs> please delete that. <laughs> uh, and then, oh wait a minute, I forgot to mention something else, yeah, at the time Somewhere, for some reason, yeah, this is before detached service, for some reason they needed more people in China. So a bunch of us were sent into China in Luliang, which is near Kunming. Uh, and we, we, we were established there and we were to fly back and forth we had flown over the hump to Luliang before, during the mm -hmm. monsoon season. We were to be established there for how long we didn't know, of course. And where we would go back to the States, go back to India, come back to Luliang, or, or uh, pick up something in Luliang and fly to Sichuan or Guilin or other places where the Chinese were f holding back or trying to hold back the Japanese. And also supplying the 14th Air Force. The, uh, Chenault's Flying Tigers. So we, f we supplied them with gasoline and stuff like that. So we were in India, in China, for two or three months. I think two, I think, no, two or three months. Mm -hmm. And while there, I shared a tent also with Bob. So we had, you know, we were, became very close friends. Mm -hmm. Very. But however close you were, you were still at war. So he went back to Ohio. I stayed in New York City, and I, I contacted him briefly after the war, but then I got involved in my own life, you know, mm -hmm. married, that sort of thing. But then, oh, I don't know, about six, seven years ago, I, the name, his name always stayed with me. And I thought, I'm going to look him up on the Internet. And I found several Bob Locantos, five of them. I sent a postcard to each one, saying I'm looking to get in touch with Bob Locanto. It was a got a call from this guy, enthusiastic about hearing from me and so on. So we became friends again. And we shared. It turns out he became a uh, professor of uh, journalism in, uh, in, in, the, in Illinois, after having done other things too. And uh, he, and so I, I visited, and we, we still share so many of the same interests. Really, it's remarkable. We have very different backgrounds. We share much the same, with one exception. 
He's crazy about flying. He has his own plane, which delights me because I go to when I go to visit him, I fly with him, and it's fun. So and so here's this here's this old, other old geezer <laughs> flying a plane. You have some photographs. Yeah, to show us. yeah. <laughs> This is this is a photograph that if you just hold it like this. Okay. Yep, I can this is zoom right in on it. Okay. This is a photograph. Jay Cutler, whom you interviewed. Ah. And I. He he was my friend uh, during my teenage uh -huh. years, and a year after the, this photograph was taken, he became my brother-in-law, marrying my sister. Uh, we decided 1946. Okay. Okay. To go to a. You got it. Yeah. Okay. We decided to go to a photographer in the neighborhood, you know, full regalia. So I wore all the medals I had and all the, all the shoulder patches and then the staff sergeant's badges, that sort of thing. So that's, that's like the overview. Let's see, I don't have anything in order particularly. Okay, if I... Sure, around, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. This picture is of several of my friends in India. Are you in that picture? I, I, I may have taken this picture. Let's see. No, I'm not in this picture. Okay. I, I got it. But uh, this, so this picture shows um, George Johnson who was on the right here. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was shot down. The other one on the left is Bob Lacanto who was... Mm -hmm. Still around, and we share. And the middle guy was a, a Gurkha. We we employed Gurkhas, little Indian uh, fighters, mm -hmm. who never carried weapons except they could, the Gurkha knife, uh, who to guard our planes at night. Let's see. Now there's a picture here. I think of me and Bob. Yeah, here's a. Oh, here's here's, here's a picture. Of me, Bob, and George. George is the one who got shot down. Okay, got it. This is in India. We were in various places in India. This is the what we call the Basha, where we lived. It's very. I mean, the, as you can see, the life was not difficult mm -hmm. when we were while we were living. Okay, got it. And then, on the other hand, and yeah, it also had a thatched roof. Let's see. On the other hand, in some places, we lived in tents. Okay. I'll stay in India for a while. And, and yeah. you mentioned you had a blood chip there that yeah. you were going to show us? Yeah. Oh, that's a nice one. Now, did you have that sewn on the back of your jacket? Yeah, yeah. I had it sewn on the, I'm not sure, the black, the back, no, on the inside. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, on your jacket. Oh, yeah. So you wore that sewn inside your jacket? Yeah, That's yeah. I may have, you know, I have something else I didn't bring with me. I have something like this, except it has many different languages of the, of the mm -hmm. area, Burmese, etc. I don't remember if I wore it or not. I know I had it, so I may very well have worn it on the outside of the jacket, mm -hmm. but I don't remember. But this one, I wore this to show all the paraphernalia. You know, the hat, the helmet, that sort of thing. I, 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 I have this one. In India, The cows in the street. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the taller, lean guy was a guy on whose crew I flew many times. Mm -hmm. okay. But then I was taken off, and uh, un unfortunately, he uh, he and his crew crashed into a mountain in China, mm -hmm. taking off. They just couldn't get the height. Mm -hmm. The other fellow was a guy who who roomed with me and Bob. Let's see. Yeah, this is. Oh yeah, here's, here. Now who is this? this I, don't, I don't know if this is Bob or me. Here, the blood shits on the back. 
Okay. All right. Down to two. Okay. Now this is, yeah, this is in China. They had conscripts. Okay. Then more China here. Okay. And this is an it's an over overview of China. And this, this I took this picture because there were guys who spent their kind of like their working days carrying these huge loads of water up to that water tank on top, Car up the steps, and they're Chinese coolies, of course. Okay. Okay, we have one minute left. Okay. Let me show you one more thing. Okay. This is a survival kit we were given. This I was I did take with me. Oh, okay. I've had this ever since. And it fit into the side pocket of your flight suit. Uh-huh. And it carry has various things. It had a little compass on top. There's Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum. Uh, a chocolate mix you can make hot chocolate with. Probably matches and band-aids. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, a little vial of matches. I don't know where they are right now, but they're in here, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. That was a very good interview. Thank you. Thank you.